Who here knows the show A Californication? Raise your hand. Yeah? No one else knows about that show? Is that not the millennial thing? Yeah, Hank Moody, Californication. Who here thinks Hank Moody is witty? Like so witty, or like how does he have all those comebacks? No one else? No one thinks Hank Moody has charisma and is witty? Are you kidding me? That's what the show is! It's him being witty! Wake up! What the? Uh. This is the first, this is, it's this by the way, that leads to genius videos and products. It's looking at <laughs> deadness in you and just being like, no! <laughs> no like literally, I have dream nightmares where I'm just like, wake up! It's in you! Wake up! Yet, unfortunately, most people will leave this room and go back to what? Boring. Their boring lives! Yes. Boring results, dead inside. And I've seen it for years, and there's some more frustration. I see people years later, you might even come back like, maybe I'll be back in two years, and you, you're still the boring job. And I ask you the question about Hank Moody, and there's still the boring answer. <laughs> Truth. Now, here's the cool thing for those of you who actually do work on your charisma. The competition is low. Yes. If you look at the deadness in this room, literally. <laughs> no, for real, like, the amount <laughs> and again, I used to be worse than you, by the way. It's easy for me to say up here, but like, if you watch some of my old pictures and I put them out, I'm completely honest. Like, I was the type of guy who was like nervous at a Christmas dinner with like cousins and family and stuff. Why? Because they're like, Julian, what's new with you? I couldn't speak. I'd be like, nothing, Grandma. I was the old, probably one of the only people who like dreaded Christmas. I'm like, the holidays are coming. I have anxiety. Like, not the holidays. That was me. If I can do it, so can you. There literally is no excuse. And I didn't have all this content. I had to figure it out just like going on my own, going out in the street and being like, well, let's start slow. Let's ask someone for the time. Who would be the easiest person to ask for the time? Old ladies. They're friendly, right? Couldn't do it. I'd be walking around like, there's no, okay, here we go. Ask her for the time. Ask her for the time. The old lady be walking up. Five minutes later, we approach, because again, they walk pretty slow. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Here we go. Uh, and I'd freeze and they'd walk past. Couldn't ask for the time. And then what, it, what do we do? We're like, right, we can do this, come on. And I'd turn around and keep trying to find the opening, the perfect opportunity to ask for the time. Would freeze. If I can do it, so can you. And it really comes down to committing to it. It's like, am I going to live this boring life? You have just one life. You know, here's another thing to sink into. <laughs> it's so funny. You hear these motivational videos, you know, people have all these regrets on their deathbed. Right? I find this hilarious, by the way. Absolutely hilarious. It's horrible and sad, but so funny that we all know this, that everyone ha has regrets on their deathbed. What are the two most common regrets? I wish I would have allowed myself to be happier. I wish I would have jumped at more opportunities and not held back so much. And there's some little music in the background, like doo -doo 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 -doo. And we watch that on Instagram. We're like, <laughs> it brings a tear to my eye. Yeah, you're right. I should allow myself to be happier and also jump at opportunities. Oh, back to the boring life. And we forget about it like that. Here's something funny. If I told you today that you had a disease that is going to kill you, would something change? No. If you, would your perspective change? Would your attitude towards life change? Yeah. And if the answer is yes, you are blind to reality. Because guess what? You have a disease that's going to kill you. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're gonna die first, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, you're all gonna die. Now, here's this disease. You have it, okay? Diagnosed by me. Now, I can guarantee one thing. You are all gonna die. However, I can't guarantee when. You could die tonight. You could die tomorrow. The disease could get you in a week. The disease could get you in 50 or 60 years. And that disease is called being alive. None of us survive. We try so hard. No you're all gonna die. So if right now it surprises you, like, oh man, if I find out I had a disease, something would change, make those changes. And literally, I view this as even like my responsibility to the human race, my responsibility to all those who didn't. All those little videos, like, on oh, my deathbed, it's like, you know what? I'm not gonna let that be me. For real, too many people let that be them. It's your responsibility to not let that be you. Live a life that's true to you so that when you die, there are no regrets. When you die, you're like, you know what? I milked this experience that is being alive. You know what? I'm not gonna be one of those people who's thrown in this little Instagram video. I'm gonna be in the Instagram video. I'm gonna be the old person who's like, hey, you know what? Milked it. 
and I die. How many people? How, how many? How many people in here actually feel as though if you were to die tomorrow, you you would be satisfied with the quantity and quality of life you've lived right now? You miserable souls. Yeah, we've you poor souls. We've we seen some shit, me and this guy. We've been around, okay? Like I, I could be totally happy with that. So think about that. Yeah, and no one is going to do it for you. It comes down to you. You know, if you read some biographies, there was one that completely changed my life. It was a Jim Morrison biography. I read this when I moved to LA. I quit university, moved to LA. It's like almost 10 years ago now. And I would read it. And I was fascinated with people who had charisma. And for me, he was one that had like, the, he was my idol of charisma. You know, I loved the original, again, the actual Jim Morrison, but then I also liked the movie remake. People hate, the, the actual Doors fan hate the movie remake. They're like, it's exaggerated. Is it, yeah, Val Kilmer, oh, they hate it. I loved it, and I loved the portrayal because there's that same charisma. And I would read the book, and you know, I'd read the main biography, I'd read the ones that the drummer would write, any little bit of information I got. I'm like, you know what? Why can't that be me? What is blocking me from tapping into that or living that type of life? Nothing. And I went for it. Why? Because you're going to die. You know, we play it so safe. It's like, yo, life's going to fly by, you're going to die. You don't have to play it so safe. Even if you mess up, eh, you'll be dead soon enough. So why not try? Why not go all out? Why not live your life so when you look back at some crazy movie? You can all do it. Why don't you? You know? Here's another perspective to sink into since we're <laughs> diving into death. Think of life as some crazy video game. You know, say I had like a new GTA minus the killing and, sh and stuff, you know? Here's GTA 10. It will come out in 50 years. I lend it to you. I'm like, you have seven days to play the game, then I want it back. That is life. Imagine this experience alive. It's like you're born, it's like, here's your body. You're like, okay, uh, you got a certain amount of time, but then I want the body back. How are you gonna live your life so that when you give the game back, or say there's an afterlife and you're in the afterlife and someone asks you like, hey, so what did you do with life? You're like, well, I played it pretty safe. I, you know, I got my boring job and my boring commute and my boring breakfast, but it was a safe life and here I am. That's like saying, I get the game back. I'm like, hey, so did you have fun with the game? You're like, well, no. I mean, I, I walked around this one block in, in GTA 10 and it was very safe and I did it. I was like, okay. And, but, but I did make a lot of money. I'm like, oh, really? Yeah, I did the taxi cab missions. Um, I, it wasn't very passionate, but I sure started collecting that money. And uh, now the game's done. That's what we do. No, if you had that game and I'm like, seven days, you'd go explore, right? You'd see like, what is this game? What are all the different areas of the map of this game? Let's go all out. You might try the taxi cab for a day, and if it's not for you, it's like, well, that's not for me. Let's try this other thing. Treat life that way. How are you gonna answer that question? When it ends, someone asks you, so what did you do with the game? Are you going to be the taxi cab person? Are you going to be the person who just like doesn't even touch the controller, just stands there the whole time like, well, I didn't really play at all. Or are you going to milk it? Are you going to be like, man, I tried everything in that game. Everything. Who are you going to be? Because that day will come. I mean, who, who knows if someone will ask you after. <laughs> who knows if there's an afterlife. Someone's like, so, the game that is life? But yeah, jump in and mess around. You can't really mess up. It just adds to the journey, the story. And guess what? The journey and the story and even the mess ups add to the charisma you have. Because now you have some crazy stories to share. Most people are boring and run out of things to say because they haven't lived. They've just existed. I'm banned, yeah. I'm banned from a continent. He is. <laughs> how, many people, how many people can say that? Say, are, you, are you banned too, Greg? No. no. <laughs> Maybe after this video, you'll be banned. <laughs> now, the goal is not to be banned. No. Greg has proved this. You can have charisma without being banned. Because I might also be banned. <laughs> We're not sure. We're not sure. We haven't tried to go back. But it's true. But if you think about it, like even awkward situations in your life make for great stories. Even failures in your life. You take a risk and say you fail. You're like, oh, you know, I lost all that money and I failed. There's an amazing story to share. You just have to be willing to put yourself in those situations. You know, there's a quote from um, uh, the author. It's like uh, Hunter Thompson, the Hunter fear, and, Thompson. Yeah, fear and loathing in Las Vegas. So it's not from that, but he says, you know what? You should arrive at the end of life. It's like the finish line. 
is if you're in this car and the wheels are falling off, not because you lived an unhealthy life, but because you really lived. Like you drove that car and you're like arriving, it's like wheels fall off and you're like, I lived. As opposed to this clean, mint condition car that's never been driven. And it's like, I, here it is. I lived, I guess. No. Live. And embody that even while going out. Experience. Like, there's nothing that feels better than when you tap into that charisma and you unleash it. There's nothing. You're fully being you in all cylinder. Like, everything's just a line. Yeah. It just makes it's sense. Flow, it's what, what they call a flow state, right? Yeah. Or peak experience. It does require feeling. If you're someone who just lives up here, mentally, in the mental, logical, analytical realm, you will not have charisma. That is the land of the robot. It's like, I am trying to have charisma. I will say the same line Julian said, and hopefully it will also be charismatic. No, you gotta learn how to feel. Get into your body. If you can't feel, there's step number one. And guess what? Most people can't. Most people, even in terms of expressing how they feel, even a smile, they are unable to smile. Client after client, in terms of going out and socializing, I'm like, give me a smile. What's their smile like? It's like, <laughs> like that. I'm like, what is that? It's like, I'm, so, I'm like, smile. They're like, they can't smile. They can't. They, they, they have, have a very, very uh, uh, and they're like, like deadpan hurts. face. Hurts. I'm like, smile more. To the point where it's like tears are coming out. It hurts. We call it sad face, S-A-D, like serious, anxious, and depressed. And it's just, it's just this, this kind of like mask, yeah. this facial armor that they wear. Or the blockage, like it looks like they're about to take a dump. They're like, <laughs> like so stiff, so nervous. It's like, but you know, but, but to speak to what he was saying about like arrive at the end of life in the beat up car, it's like, yeah. even on a microcosmic scale, when you're going out, I don't remember Rejection. I don't remember that. I, I, likely you don't either. And I know that you may have heard us say that kind of thing before, and you might think, oh, that's some kind of hyperbole that they use to say it's okay to, to be rejected. It's like, no, no, no. We literally cannot recall the details of the specific rejection, mm. right? I, it's just like, oh, now, to be fair, if it was like some sort of mechanical error that I made that, that caused it, or I, I slipped up, I did something I, I shouldn't have done, Okay, let's etch that little neural pathway. Remember the lesson, like reiterate the lesson to myself, but then the specifics are not written to disc. Mm. It's just like some nebulous face that was like, nice to meet you, durr, and like ran, you know, walked off. So, but what I do remember very vividly is not taking action. I have like a memory that just flashed now. It's like at the train station waiting for my train to go home in Switzerland and just not being able to say hi to anyone. I'm like, I gotta be more social. Couldn't say hi to anyone and that, state there, it's like the self-attack kicks in, the disappointment, even the hopelessness. We're like, is it ever gonna work for me? What if it never works? What's wrong with me? Why do everyone else have it so much easier but not me? And that just stings. And I'm sure you've experienced that. You go home and like, you have a good cry in your pillow and then you try again. But that does sting. It's not this fake front that you manage. And that's how I used to feel. It's like, there's me and I'm just like, okay, I must put on this front, the acceptable front and it was a very stifled, shy front. And then I'd go out and I was like, well, gotta maintain it. They can't see the real me because I'm not good enough. If they see through this front, that's bad. I gotta get validation to reinforce the front and I gotta act through it. It's just so much pressure and heaviness and you just feel that inauthenticity. It's like being the ultimate people pleaser. You know, we think people pleasers just saying yes when we mean no or no when we mean yes, but no. Most of society, we're all people pleasers. And this is why most of us, even when going out, it's like we feel like imposters, right? It's like, oh, they're gonna discover the real me. What does that mean, discover the real me? Why are you not putting the real you out there? Why do you believe that the real you is so pathetic that you have to hide it, right? And when you actually put it out, you tap into it, you have that self-respect where it's like, you know what? No, I'm no longer gonna compromise who I am. I'm gonna put it out there and you just feel alive, there is no going back. There is no going back to the fake front. You just can't. You fall in love with it and you fall more and more in love with it every day and every day you learn more about it. Like that's the beauty. It's like at first you'll have the gist of what charisma is. You're like, wow, I can unleash it. And then the more you familiarize yourself with it, the range expands. Like my range versus five years ago, 10 years ago, completely expanded. 20 years from now, it'll be the same thing and it'll keep expanding. And you can link that to every area of life. Are you expanding or not?
Yeah, it's infinite potential for growth as well. You just keep expanding your range of choice potential, mm -hmm. right, in, in different situations. And, <clears throat> you know, sometimes you want to be more reserved. Sometimes you want to be more energetic, but you have the choice. You're not defaulting to one or the other. Yeah. You know, what do most guys default to when they, when they go out to, to meet people. someone? What do most people default to when they're, at, when they're trying to socially interact with someone they just met? Yeah, so generally they will default to interview style questions. Yeah. Mm. So what do you do? Where do you live? What about local sports team? The weather certainly has been interesting lately, has it not? Oh, what do you do? What do, you do? Oh, did I already ask that one? <laughs> do you like it? So the, 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 the thing is, most, most people that default to that, they do that because they don't know what else to do. We could even go up and, and speak to people and use the interview style questions and have it work. And I've done that before. I remember I, I was out with my friend uh, Kyle, and I was like, tonight, let's do chode night. <laughs> right? We're, basically, we're just going to go up, and we're just going to say, so, what's up? <laughs> You're beautiful. Where do you live? What do you do? Hand on the lower back. <laughs> and we're like, okay, this is going to be a disaster. Okay, get ready. Uh, here we go. So, but then it started working. Like, they're like, oh, hey, no. I did. And they were responding very, very well. And I was confused. I was like, what's happening here? And I, and I realized it's because they could sense on a certain level, for, again, for most people, when they're defaulting those interview questions, it's like, a, it's like they're desperately treading water. Like, oh, I hope the questions don't run out. I hope the questions don't run out. Because if they run out, they're done. Right? But with us, they could tell it's coming from a more proactive place. Like at any, you know, we're kind of chilled back, but at any moment, we could be like, Haruken, Shoryuken, and we could like bust out some crazy shit. So they can tell, again, what's that old saying? You learn how to fight so you don't have to, right? It just becomes part of a field of choice potential. So if we're choosing to be a little bit more reserved, they can tell that's a proactive decision on our part, mm. right? If that makes sense. Yeah, the words are simply the vehicle for the person to experience you. That's really it. Why does it work if we go up and say like the traditional things like, who here really cares about the weather? You ever think about that? Like, so the weather's really nice or what's the weather like in X, Y, Z place? No one, no one that I've seen in my life gets excited by that. Like, oh, let me pull it up. Oh, it says there's 60% of rain. <laughs> like, no one's into this. How is it that we make it work? Because we find it funny. It's when you actually start enjoying, like, oh, this is funny. We're going to the regular boring questions. It becomes this inside joke with you. And then guess what? What does the person experience? Whatever you're experiencing. If you're laughing at it, like, oh, I'm doing, like, the boring night. Like, what's up? And it's like, uh, not much. What about you? Not much either. The weather, it's like, I find that funny and it'll work because that person will also find it funny as opposed to the traditional person who's like, yeah. tell, please like me, what's up? Don't make me look, do, you, do, you, do I'm cool? Do, do you like the what's up question? <laughs> look, I studied the weather. I really studied the weather for you. In fact, that would actually work better if you oh, said yeah. it like that, yeah. <laughs> that was a huge... You an answer prepared, like, what's the weather? You're like, well, I've actually studied this very carefully. <laughs> Meteorologically. <laughs> For me, that was a huge realization, uh, was that people are not as attracted to the content of what you're saying so much as the vibe. Yeah. Now look, don't get me wrong. I know that sometimes I see people become attracted by the content. I, you know, I, I got bars, as they say, and, and, and sometimes like, I see them becoming attracted to me because of the, the content. However, it's more of an intellectual a, a, attraction, if you will. They're like, oh, my, his brain seems to work. <laughs> Might be a little crazy, but, uh, you know, he's able to be unstifled in a social pressure situation and come up with these things. Okay, that, that's interesting. But beyond that, I mean, that... He knows a lot of words. Yeah, he knows a lot of big words. <laughs> I used to uh, read the dictionary as a child for fun. It's a true story. Didn't have a lot of friends. Uh, <laughs> the dictionary was... Miriam Webster was my friend. But... Um, falling asleep like... That yeah, falling asleep. Today. Yeah, you learned a very yeah. Word. <laughs> but but again, like what I see is that deeper, that more visceral attraction that that comes from here. You know, that's that, that's generated by the feeling, the vibe that makes them want to stay near you. Yeah. And then, so again, that's sort of like a vertical expansion of feeling. But then you also have this horizontal expansion of plot development, if you will moving it towards the goal of the interaction, whatever that is, whether that's you know, be becoming more intimate with that person or whether that's closing the business deal or resolving the conflict, whatever the case may be. Again, you, you have this, this vertical idea expansion 
of the vibe that's causing them to want to be around you. That forms sort of the ostensible reason that they're even there. And then you have that external knowledge, like I said, that we've gone over in excruciating detail over the past 17 years in our back catalog of how to move things along you know, towards, towards an end goal. Yeah, think of it like a movie script, where it's like, of course there has to be a script to a movie, but guess what? If the acting is bad, that movie is bad, yeah. right? So you gotta master the acting, and then of course, Think of it even like this. You could have the most amazing script with horrible acting or an average script with amazing acting. Which movie is going to succeed? Right? Yet, what do we do in terms of interactions? I got to master the script. It's like, no, learn how to not be an actor in terms of like faking stuff, but learn how to embody some life. You know, and then if you combine that with, like you said, some width or a good script, then it becomes even better. You know, but this is really the foundation. Again, people experiencing you. And what do they want to experience? Fun, carefree, passion. And what this means is when you see someone who is charismatic, you know, so you might be watching us here on stage. You might be like, you know what? I guess I better also read the dictionary at night. It's like, no. What you got to identify here is, okay, what do they feel right now in this moment? Okay, what, how do they make themselves feel? Again, that fun, carefree passion. And your question to yourself should be, how can I make myself feel that same way? What can I say or do so that I feel just as much fun, carefreeness, and passion as them? And yeah. it'll be different. Yeah, it's interesting that he mentioned uh, you know, acting because in, in researching this, these exercises to develop these capacities, like I studied a wide, I, and I, I've been studying this stuff for about a year because I really wanted to dig down to what's going on. What's preventing these guys from taking action? So I looked at a wide variety of things from cognitive behavioral therapy to like peak athletic performance training to obscure acting methods to um, even like transcendental approaches and things like that. But ultimately that's what it is. It's like understanding how the system functions, how all of the inter, how the parts interrelate, reinforce each other and to, to open it up for the most pure expression. And then number two, understanding what are, where are these blocks coming from? I think most of the time we talk about generalized negative social conditioning, right? Right, you've all heard us talk about negative social conditioning, right? But what is that? What, what does that even mean? And look, I think the vast majority of social conditioning is good. It's pretty good, right? Don't kill people. Don't, don't take your dick out at the bus stop. Like, like these things are all, like they serve society in good ways. But then there's a lot of it that's just extremely repressive. And I wanted to, you know, there's a, there's, and there's a whole host of these. I've identified like maybe 14 specific types of, of negative social counter conditioning that are blocking you from, again, self-deceit to abdication of responsibility to frozen feelings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To, uh, authority dependence, you know, and where do these things come from? From a variety of sources, the peer group, your educational system, your parents, possible religious upbringing, um, the media, maybe corporate culture. So beginning to really define exactly how, not just have this generalized negative social conditioning, but break down what are the types of negative social conditioning? And then not feeling guilt about it, not feeling, well, I suck because I'm, I've succumbed to this social conditioning. It's just getting an awareness of it. Because if you're guilty about it, that's just feeding back into the judgmentalism, which is the number one social conditioning of all that's, that's screwing with you, mm. is judgmentalism. Yeah, and when you tap into this, it's like opportunities open up left and right. Like, so much of my life and where I'm at now comes from being able to tap into that. Not just in terms of just teaching it, but people want to be around you. People who are way more successful than you than other, in other areas, like, again, huge businesses want to hang out with you, talk about you, text you, and it's like, why are they texting me? There's a bill of opposites in all of this stuff. There's so many different opposites that you have to balance. There's like internal focus, how much are you focusing on your inner process versus external? How much are you focusing on what other people are giving you? How much like energy versus repose? Right? And so, you know, how much, like even in my speech, I'll be like, how much diction do I, in articulation do I employ versus going up and being like, oh yeah, what's that smell like? You, you know, like b b b more slangy, you know, like, and I go, be I go between those. Like my verbal game, it's about one half of it, like on one end of the spectrum, there's this like cartoon pimp slash imbecile who says ridiculous things. 
And then this is juxtaposed with this like urbane articulate conversationalist. Good evening, you know, so you have to know when to use each. I remember I was out in Santa Monica, I was at this place called uh, The Bungalow. Any, anyone familiar with it? Yeah, I'm sure you all are. And, and, uh, and I saw this guy, uh, is, is obviously like a guy who studies this stuff, I can, I can spot him from a mile away at this point. And he comes up to these, these women and he said, uh, he opened them by singing Lionel Richie to them. He, you know, he's like, hello, is it me you're looking for? Like not even that good, like, like hello, is it me you're looking for? And, and they're like, and they're like uh, no, it was not you, this guy was an African American. So, um, so uh, unless I don't know something about what I'm seeing here, um, and then, and then they're like, and they're, you know, I guess it's a common thing. And they're like, yeah, and then they're like, ha, 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 hilarious. But then he just kept doing this shtick. Like, he's like, and here's another wacky thing. <laughs> and you saw, their, you, saw, you saw their faces go from like, oh, fun, to like, oh. Okay. Oh, oh, well, what else? Oh, okay. Oh, very funny. Okay, well, we got to go. You know, it's like, oh, this is his shtick. There's two sides of the coin. Some people, um, and all of you probably will identify with one side of the coin. Um, some people start off and they, they, they do nothing. They, they come in, like, they do the bare minimum. Um, mm -hmm. And they're just, like, kind of weak and soft and they need to speak up and they need to be more charismatic. But then other people come on with a bit too much energy and it, it feels like a shtick. Like, it feels like, hey, I'm Greg Gallagher, you know, fitness coach, we're gonna get Jack. Like, that's not how I sounded. You know, we're gonna do, you know. <laughs> or your, your voice becomes a little more, like, it becomes a little more enunciated. Like, we're doing intermittent fasting, black coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, but you, uh, if you guys, like, put your hands up if, you're, if you tend to be a little more on the soft side where you're too chill and boring. That's less than half. Oh, it's hmm. maybe half, and then, the people, who's the people that come on like too strong? I can guarantee in this crowd, 90% of you are on the more chill. You are not too strong. <laughs> Way 90%, too chill. 90% more chill. Yeah. If you believe you're too strong, that's the first lie to just break, right. like, no. Nah. Stop lying to yourself. You are way too chill. It's like right now, it looks like I walked into a room of like beaten children, just like, please don't hit me, sir. Like literally, that's what it looks like. It's like it's fear. I just see fear and panic and sadness and helplessness. You, you, you know you're good on your camera. Like you, a, a, good, a good litmus test is, if you fi fi finish the video and you wanna watch it three or four times, you're probably pretty good. Yeah. But if you watch it like the first time and you're like, damn. But you know what, <laughs> most people won't put themselves out there. Won't, they won't take the steps mm. to start a business. They won't watch that first YouTube video because they wanna be good immediately. And it doesn't happen. Ultimately, what you have to do is just put it out there. Stop thinking about yourself. And this comes, you guys can mm. apply this to anything, but people get so focused on themselves. Oh my God, what, you know, what if they don't like me? Or what if I'm cringy? Or what if my friends think I'm a loser? Well, if you genuinely want to meet someone, it could be a friend, it could be a business connection, and you feel that you can offer them value, you can help them, you can, you can add something to the table, you think that you're worthy of something, then by not taking that step, even if you might be a little awkward, and sometimes you're really awkward, but it still works anyway. But by not taking that step, your, 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 your potential customers, your potential friends, potential partner, they're losing out. Mm. They're losing out. And just like Julian said, your life is ending. And probably in the last one week, we've all stopped ourselves from doing something that we probably could have done. You know, we've, we've, maybe it was talking to someone or putting out that YouTube video. And so from this moment forward, what we want to do is start taking action. Because you're not going to regret making that, taking that step, putting that video out there, and it's only gonna make you grow. And as long as we just sit back and just watch everything go by, we're losing out on this life thing. We're not learning, we're not growing, we're not advancing. This thing is ending. We need to start to build that muscle. It's a muscle just like anything else. Just like going to the gym, doing your incline, incline press. <laughs> <laughs> just like doing that, you're gonna build that muscle. And the more you take action, the more you put that YouTube video, and you know what? Film something or, or, or do something, you don't even have to post it. Just do the first step, just film it, and you can sit on it. You know, have a friend that supports you. You know, it's too easy to get caught up in a social circle of people that hold you down. Just like mm. most people, they live their boring life, they get in their boring car. If those are your friends, I'm sorry, that's who you're gonna be. So you need to start to put yourself out there and meet the right people, they're gonna lift you up. They're gonna support you taking that step. And as you do that, you'll be amazed at what happens. If you look at, you know, Julian's probably his closest friends, Jeffy, I know in Toronto, I have really cool friends that are doing all kinds of things, real estate, uh, 
filmmaking, and I surround myself with the right people because I know how important that is. So as yeah. you go through life, you want to you think about that and be really cognizant um, and start taking that action, start building that muscle, start getting sharper, because once you start to build that momentum, it's amazing what happens. You'd be so surprised at how your life changes and unfolds. I love what you said when you're like, don't make it about you. You know, because it's true. There are some videos that I put out where I'm like, I'm not a fan of this one. However, is the content good? Yes. Will it help someone? Yes. And view it even like that. If you're talking to someone, don't rob them of that opportunity of truly knowing you. Don't just put out the front. Let them know you. Get your ego out of it. It's the same with a video. It's like, how do I look? What will people think of me? You're making it about you. Will it help them? Focus on being of service and giving and you will be unstoppable. This is, this is huge, the, the, the giving part. It's a huge problem with our generation is that people are so focused on themselves. I'll get people Instagram DM me and say, hey, I wanna build a fitness business. Can you shout me out? No, <laughs> I'm not shouting. Do you think that when Julian or Jeffy or even my, I started on this fitness thing, I didn't ask for anything. Yeah. Mm. I didn't ask for a single thing. I just started putting things out. And if you have that mindset that someone has to give you something, someone has to help you get known, then you are so focused on yourself and you're going into the world asking and taking. And one quote that I really, really love by Eckhart Tolle is that, is that we think, it's, it's that whatever you think the world is withholding from you, whether it's money, whether it's love, uh, secretly we are withholding that from the world. So we're going through the life thinking just about us, us, what we're not getting, what we're not getting. Think about what you're not giving. And in any interaction, whether you want to make a connection, I've had people that have made connections with me that have no followers simply because they were in a giving state. And I had people that were big that just were, you know, they had this weird energy that I did not like. And you want to foster that really good energy where you're thinking about how can I really help this person? How can I bring something to the table? Because I guarantee once you focus on that and you're bringing value to the table, um, and it doesn't have to be like this, you don't have to, you know, just go and take someone out to expensive dinner. You don't have to spend a ton of money. You don't have to be someone that's super cool, but just be willing to help them and bring in a good energy and not ask for anything in return right away. You know, you want to be assertive at a certain point, but the, the idea is that you're giving a lot of value before you even think about yourself. And that's when the natural uh, law of recipro reciprocity, how do you say that word? Recip recipro reciprocity. reciprocity. That's when the natural law of reciprocity kicks in. And I feel, <laughs> like, I, feel like I, I had someone take me out to a dinner recently, and they took me out to this big dinner at Jacobs & Co in Toronto, and then uh, like they bought me this nice steak, $300 meal, and I signed up for their $5,000 seminar. Just because I got a $300 steak. I felt I had to. I was like, I can't take a free steak, I gotta do it. So think about what you can give. How did you get this way? Did you start out this way? That's a question I get all the time. Uh, you know, on, on the live program, I had a student a few months ago now, and at the end he said, Jeff, all right, this has been great, but I have one question for you. Going forward, I, I notice when we're out, you're very ebullient, you're able to interact with people and just be very free. Were you always like this? Were you always like this? And if not, how did you change? And I told him, I said, no, I was not always like this. In fact, if you saw me, in fact, if you saw Tyler or myself 15 years ago, you would have no doubts in your mind whatsoever about your ability to be good at this stuff. None. Because we were like psychos, okay? We were like emotionally very not well off. You know, I, I was, I guess, what you would call, challenged. Cha emotionally challenged, yes. I, I was, I guess, what you would call uh, an edge lord, right? Uh, like, a, like a trench coat wearing, uh, trench coat mafia type, type looking fellow with a, with a terroristic haircut um, who would wear a sword that he bought from Home Shopping Network to the, to the grocery store um, type of individual. Yeah, so like very, you know, kind of like outgoing, but like in acting out, like bold, not confident, right? And so he said, how did you change? And, and the way I changed was, it's quite simple. I saw the stuff I was doing didn't work. If I act like this, people don't respond well. It doesn't work. So I started to explore different things. Now, all learning is movement into the unknown, both externally, I'm going to you know, explore these different ways of being, explore these different ways of interacting, and internally, I'm gonna explore that, those unknown places in myself. So this can be very uncomfortable for people, as all exercise, you know, and learning, and, and exercise, what you're essentially doing is you're, expo you're intentionally 
exposing weaknesses in yourself, which is something that we are conditioned to not do, to show weaknesses. So by exercising, practicing, you're revealing weaknesses that allow you to isolate those, strengthen them, and then reintegrate them into the overall whole, right? So a lot of it is just understanding that you have to move into the unknown. And that doesn't mean charging at the unknown head on, because there's a barrier. What's the barrier? Your capacity, right? Your capacity for skill in that particular area, whatever it is. So you want to start to you know, get creative and approach it in, in oblique ways, maybe, to get through that barrier and understand it's going, to, it's going to be a process. You are not a product. You are a process. This results, this end product orientation really screws a lot of people up. You got to get into this headspace where, a per look, a person is not a product. You might think you're a product when you're getting negative reviews from the people you're interacting with, but that's just, again, that's just their impression of you at one stage along that process. Focus on others, be of service. Think of that just in terms of the world itself. You know, if you're not gonna commit to truly putting yourself out there, to cultivating that charisma, even if it's not just for you, do it for the world. You know, whatever you choose to believe, there is only one you. No one else in this world is like you. You have a unique imprint, you could say, on this world. It's your duty it's your responsibility to really live that to the max, to live up to your fullest potential. Otherwise, you are robbing the world of your gift. You might not believe it. You're like, Julian, what gift do I have? Guess what? In this process, you will discover it. If you don't, you are literally robbing the world of your gift. Do not rob the world of your gift. Do not be, unfortunately, like most people, living fake lives, boring lives, just stuck in the mundane, stuck in a routine. Wake up. It's your responsibility, it's your duty as a human being to what? Wake up. To what? Wake up. To what? Wake up. Good. Remember this, because you will forget. You'll get sucked right back in. Remember this moment. It's your duty. And until you do, trust me, you can't cheat it. You can't cheat your way out of this. You'll feel worse and worse and worse. And again, you'll be like most old people where if you look at them, you would never want to trade lives with them because their life went downhill. Don't let that be you. It doesn't have to go downhill. I was talking about before. It's like if you look at some of our old videos versus now, it's going uphill. And it's going to keep going uphill. Yeah, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, some personality. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Like this program is such a game changer. The way everything's structured and the material, it's been already even for me, it's just been, I'm noticing a crazy change in, in the way that my whole life's like playing out. What you put together is just incredible. There's nothing like that. I've just jumped like a million levels. It's just been a complete 180 for my experience of existing. That's awesome. <laughs> it's just been so huge in terms of so many of the things I'm finally understanding and realizing and epiphanies I'm having. What you do is a huge inspiration to me and I think it's one of the most beautiful things you can give to another human in this entire world. You saved my life, man. I'm telling you, that's, this is real, man. Sometimes all it takes is just one person who believes in you. Find people who are where you are in life and model them, work with them. I would not be here if I didn't have people who held me accountable. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just felt a click and things are changing. This program was just top notch. Seriously, like this is a masterpiece. This is, this is perfect. Everything, the way it's set up, the live calls, like all the support from the coaches is incredible. It's, it's been nuts. I just have my test joy. This was the best decisions I ever made. Thank you for creating something wonderful like this. This program was phenomenal. This program was, uh, was amazing. This program has definitely changed my life. I know for a fact I'm in the right place. This is exactly what I was expecting from the program. It's been uh, spectacular. I feel really lucky to, to have found you. Thank you so much, Julian. It's, uh, it's worth every dollar.